Hi, everyone. We're so excited. We're going to have a great Zoom. We're going to have a great webinar. Olga, can you just please confirm that everyone stays on mute? Okay, good? Yes. All right. And also just confirm that they can chat with host and co-host only so that we're all set. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Good. Everyone, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm really glad that we're using this opportunity right now. Is everyone good? I'm monitoring the group as well. Everyone's logging in. All right. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we're so proud of you. And thank you for making time to join this webinar. Um, Olga, can we also record? Are we recording right now? Yes, I clicked record. Good. I just want to remind all of you, this is a very special time in your lives. You are learning. Knowledge is power. This is a very, very special time. Good luck to everyone. Olga is a pro. She's taught SHSAT reading comprehension strategies, math strategies, poetry strategies, vocabulary, grammar, everything. We could not be in better hands than we are. We are with the pro. So everyone, I want to assure you, we brought out the big guns for this exam prep right now. So Olga is a full-time medical student in her third year and as graduate of a specialized high school herself, and I'm letting you know that we are playing to win. Olga, we are so happy and so grateful that you're doing this. And I'm listening. The students are listening. And even our cute little doggy Goldie is listening. She's back here. And I just want to remind all of you, knowledge is power. You're going to learn a lot from this webinar. I even have Goldie here in the backdrop. Okay. And, um, and just remember to stay very, very focused as you're learning. Keep prepping. Keep reviewing. All right, and um, I don't know, we're gonna wish everyone a lot of good luck. All right, let's go, Olga, we are ready, okay? Let's go. Okay, hi everybody again, um, echoing what Ms. Francis just said. I'm so happy that you all made it here. Um, I do this like every year for a few years now, it's been kind of a tradition, so I'm so excited to teach again. Um, even though, like Francis said, I am a full-time medical student, but this is really important, and I hope you guys all gain something from this. Um, any questions um, during the chat uh, during the session, you guys can just directly put it into the chat, um, and I'll try to answer them. And then I'm also happy to stay at the end an extra 10, 15 minutes to answer any last minute like questions. And then uh, we have these seminars repeating on Sunday and next week, Thursday and Sunday again. So this won't be the last time you guys are seeing me. And then at the end, I always save a PDF of these notes and Mrs. Francis will get them out to you. Um, so you'll have this as well, okay? So the way that I run the session, I'm gonna talk briefly about like generalized reading comprehension strategies, kind of like my mindset before I go into a passage um, and how to organize my thoughts and before I even start reading the passage. Um, and then after we do that, um, I wanna talk to you guys a little bit about annotation and I want to show you guys how I read a passage so I'll read it out loud specifically we're going to be working on um, form a the real released exam from this year by the DOE which is an amazing practice that you guys should all be familiar with doing these tests multiple times because they're directly released by the DOE so they're going to be similar to what your test will look like on test day um, so we'll be working out of that passage. I'll read it out loud to you guys, show you sort of like my thought process and my annotation and how I organize my thoughts. And then we'll do the questions. Um, and hopefully we have time to sneak in poetry strategies as well. If not, um, I'll sneak that in on Sunday during the, the grammar lesson because there's usually less to cover in the grammar section because it's smaller on the SHSAT, okay? Um, all right, so... I'm going to go ahead and just get started. And like I said, any questions, um, you can throw them into the chat. I'll be checking periodically. Um, OK, so let's start with generalized tips for reading comprehension. What should be going through your head before you even, like when you start reading a passage? That's the mindset that I want to cover. So tips for reading comprehension. So the very first strategy or tip that I recommend to all of my students is to identify the genre of the passage that you're reading, because your mindset and the strategies that you're going to like think about as you're reading a passage are going to differ depending on if the passage is fiction or if the passage is nonfiction. So those are the two main categories that they'll throw at you on the SHSAT. Some of the passages will read nonfiction, right? It's your standard sort of newspaper article. It's very structured. 
Um, other types of things are excerpts, right? From fictional passages. There's characters, there's dialogue, there's quotations. So different ball games. So different sort of mindset that we need to think about. Um, so our first step is identifying the genre. So step one is going to be identify the genre. Um, and then following that, we're going to have two big categories, fiction and nonfiction, like I said. So we'll click fiction here and nonfiction here. And let's start with the nonfiction. So nonfiction, like I said, very structured, right? This is like your typical newspaper article, something that you would read for school and like write a thesis on, something of that sort. Mm -hmm. So the key here is that this is structured. So it's really important that you guys understand what I mean by structured, because if you understand, then you can use that to your advantage. So when we think about structure, the way that you guys are taught to write an essay, we think about the generalized thesis statement, and then you have body paragraphs with topic sentences that all relate back to that singular thesis statement. And then in each body paragraph, you have supporting details that do what? They also relate your topic sentence back to the thesis. So that's the structure that I'm talking about when I say structured. And the reason this is important is it kind of gives you a cheat sheet or a guide of where you need to look for supporting details, where you need to look to find the, the main idea which is what most of the questions on this exam are going to sort of ask you. So these nonfiction passages that are structured, you guys are getting none wrong because they're structured. You should go into them knowing exactly where to look for the information that you know they'll be asking you about. So these are kind of the passages that I really wanna hammer home that you can do really, really, really well on. We can take advantage of the structure um, as long as you know the structure. So like I said, we are gonna have a thesis statement and this is usually going to be the last sentence of your first paragraph. So again, you're running out of time, you're stressed on exam day. Um, as long as you can relate back to the structure, as long as you can identify that you're reading a nonfiction passage and you can identify um, that they're asking you the main idea, all you have to do is go to the first paragraph, find the last sentence or two, and that is going to give you your answer to that main idea question. So there should, even with the nerves and everything, we can fall back on this structure, um, this consistency and, and ace this exam. So the next thing that I mentioned was topic sentences. So these are going to be the way each one of your body paragraphs opens. And then the last thing I said is supporting details. So these are only going to be in your body paragraphs. So if a, a question is asking you about a supporting detail, you know where to look. You know that it's going to be in inside one of the body paragraphs. You're not gonna go and, and reread your introduction if the question's asking you for a supporting detail. Another major just general test strategy, not specific for reading comprehension, and we'll do a whole session on that, um, is good time management. But something like understanding structure is going to help you better manage your time. Because if you know where to look for certain answers, you're not gonna sit there and, and skim the whole passage because you become efficient with your time. You know where in the passage you wanna go back to, to get to the information that the question wants you to get to. And then the last sort of hint that's going to help you with these nonfiction passages is connotation and denotation. So I'm just going to leave it on the list for now. And then on the next page of notes, I'm going to do a whole thing about connotations because these are really, really important.
Okay, so to summarize, your thesis statement is going to be found in the last sentence of the first paragraph or your introduction. Topic sentences are in the beginning of each body paragraph, and they introduce the main idea of each body paragraph. And then supporting details support your topic sentence, and everything always relates back to the thesis. And usually in the conclusion, there's some sort of restatement of the thesis. So that's the general structure of a nonfiction passage, and that's the structure that you're going to take advantage of when you're doing the questions. So now let's think about the fictional passages. The fictional passages become a little bit more complicated, right? Because you're given a story, there's usually a plot, there's usually characters. So there's more for you to consider here. There's not one distinct structure that every single fiction passage or excerpt is going to stick to. Um, so it's harder for us to sort of zone in on that because we don't know what we're going into reading it. But there's a few things that they all have in common. So that's what we're going to hone in on to help us. So one thing that you need to focus on is the plot. You need to actually understand what is going on. What is going on? Like, what are the main events that I'm reading about? So these are the questions you should be asking yourself. as you're reading. And usually every single plot or story that they throw at you will have a climax or a turning point. There's going to be a high point that the story is sort of working its way up to. And then there's going to be a transition where everything after that one turning point kind of like changes. Usually it could be some big event happening to a character. Oops. Um, it could be some big event, life event happening to a character. It could be a big move. Um, it depends what you're reading about. But a lot of times these stories are also narrative. So the next thing that we need to think about is perspective or point of view. Who's telling us this story? That's what this is asking. And the question you should be asking yourself here is who is telling me the story? And a big hint with this, something that can kind of give this away that a lot of students don't think about um, is pronouns. So you can use pronouns to your advantage. So do you see the words I, me, my? Because these words will communicate to me that it's a narrative, right? It's a personal story. I'm telling you guys something about my life, about my mom, my parents, my career, my upbringing personal story. So that already tells you a lot of information about what you're going to be reading about and what's the perspective of the person telling you the story, right? So if I'm telling you a story about my life, that's personal, that's going to definitely be like biased. It's, it's I'm talking about events that happen to me, right? Versus if you see pronouns such as he, she, they, this is more like there's a narrator, there's a third party narrator that might know everything and you're just kind of getting the bird's eye view of the story. Does that make sense? So this is a big help. And these, this pronoun trick can kind of help you a lot and immediately, right? Because we use pronouns all the time in speech. So within the first few sentences, you'll be able to tell, is this a personal story, a narrative? Or is this like a story about three characters and there's like, a plot and there's one narrator that knows what's going on with everyone. So that will definitely frame the way that you read, the way that you think through the story. The other thing that we have to think about is characters, right? So there's always going to be character development. So your question with this is going to be, how is the character developing and changing as the story goes on? This is a very big thing that they like to ask about because sometimes that's the point of telling the story, right? How did the character, how was the character in the beginning and how is the character at the end? Similarly, these types of stories usually teach some sort of moral lesson or takeaway. So that's another thing that you should be thinking. Either what did the character learn or what did I learn? What is the moral lesson? What is the takeaway? What is the bigger point, basically? What's the point? What's the point of this whole thing? Why did the author decide to tell this story? 
Um, and that on the test, on the question, it'll say like, what is the author's purpose? That's what we're getting at with this. Usually the purpose is some lesson, either that he wants the readers to learn, that he learned or he or she learned themselves because they're telling you a personal narrator, narrative story, or one of the characters in the story learned. So that's kind of like a hint for how you should be considering those author purpose questions if you're getting a fictional passage. Um, and then we're running out of space a little bit, but I'll squeeze it in here and zoom in just so we have it all on the same page. The other easy thing to focus on is setting. Um, it's, it's asked about often. Um, so you just want to pay attention whenever you're reading a fictional story, the setting, which is basically where does this take place and when does this take place? So a lot of people remember the where, but forget the when. So think about timeline and period and chronology of the story. So the when is really, really important as well. Um, and then the last thing that I want to mention with fiction is dialogue or quotes. This is Dialogue is unique to a fiction story. You might have quotes in a nonfiction as well, but usually this is used for supporting evidence in the nonfiction, right? If somebody's using a quote, um, usually that's some sort of supporting evidence, right? They're quoting somebody to support a bigger point. Um, dialogue can actually uh, go hand in hand with the character development, right? Because that's oftentimes how we learn about characters is through what they say and how they say it. Um, so those kind of go hand in hand. Look at the dialogue to see how your characters are developing and to also evaluate the relationship between characters. All right. Any questions so far? Olga, thank you so much for doing this. I just want to remind everyone to take notes as this, it's very important that you are writing, taking notes, actively participating so that you are engaging with this. Thank you so much for doing this, Olga. Okay, and everyone, please remember that we are rooting for you, we are cheering for you, and we are very, very proud of you. All right, let's keep going. Yes, we are very, very proud of you. This is like one of the big exams of your life, but like the first of many, many, many. But it, it really, high school is an important time. It centers you, it teaches you a lot about how to study, how to be a good student. Um, and I'll talk about my high school experience at the end because I don't want to take away time, but I had a really good experience in a specialized high school. So if you guys have more personal questions on that, I'm glad to share as well. So I want to just go further on this one thing that I mentioned, connotations, and then let's kind of you know use, the, use these strategies and go ahead and do a passage together so you guys can see them in action. So when I say connotation, I want you guys to know exactly what I mean. So the definition of the word connotation, it's the meaning of a word that's implied. It's separate from the, se the literal definition. So meaning of a word which is implied. And importantly, it's separate from the literal definition. And just for some vocab, denotation is the word for the literal definition versus connotation is the word for the implication that comes with the word. And the best way to teach this, if you guys haven't heard this before, is by example. So I'm gonna give you guys an example of a word with negative connotation, neutral connotation, and positive connotation. So if we use the word, I think the most simple example is visitor. So I'm going to start with that. And then I'll show you guys like more nuanced examples, which is going to be more applicable to how you'll see this on the exam. So very basic example is the word visitor. If I just say visitor as a noun, that doesn't imply anything positive, doesn't imply negative. It's just a neutral noun, right? Somebody is visiting my home. Versus if I chose the word guest, even though it has the similar definition of somebody is coming to my home that perhaps doesn't live there, guest has a positive twist. Guest has an implication that they're my guests. I invited them. Does that make sense? This extra layer of positivity that the word visitor doesn't have. And similarly, if we want to pick a negative word, we can say something like intruder. Again, the idea is the same, that somebody's in my house that doesn't live there, but intruder has a clear negative connotation. I'm implying that I did not invite them in. They're intruding on my space. Does that make sense? 
This is like a really basic example, but authors do this in very, very nuanced ways. So they, words are not accidental, right? So words have meanings more than their literal meanings. So if you're reading a passage and the author is choosing all of these words that are negatively connotated, the reason this is important to pay attention to is because this is suggesting that the author might have a negative opinion or perspective on whatever topic he or she is writing about. Does that make sense? If I'm picking all of these slightly negatively connotated words um, to make my point. And the same thing goes true with the opposite. If I'm picking all of these positively connotating words, um, then perhaps I have a positive opinion on whatever it is that I'm writing about. Um, so another example is something like forceful. I can say assertive. If I call somebody assertive, that's a positive quality. That's taking the quality of being forceful and I'm turning it into something good. In the same way, I can um, say it as a bad thing, like domineering kind of means, sure, you're forceful and you're assertive, but you're dominating in a negative way. You're taking away the spotlight from everybody else. You're taking away everybody else's voice. You guys kind of see the point. Another example I can think of is we can say the word wet, but if I say soggy, and I'm talking about a sandwich that's definitely negatively connotated versus if I use the word moist, that could be positively connotated. Does that make sense? I saw some hands up, hands go up. Um, we wanna keep this completely muted um, just for safety purposes and for efficiency purposes. So if you guys have questions, instead of putting your hands up, just throw them into the chat and I'll address them. And I saw somebody asked about poetry strategies. We'll get to it after we do at least one passage. Thank you, Olga. Just to remind everyone, we are not allowing you to unmute yourselves. You will not have that permission because we need to move very quickly through the webinar. So everyone, please pay attention as we are moving along. Okay, um, you cannot unmute yourself. Um, so you can type into the chat. The host and co-host will see what you write and what you type. So please keep that in mind. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right. So. Are you guys ready to start a passage? Yeah? Okay, so let's do a passage together. Um, the way that I'm gonna do it is I'm going to be reading it out loud and I'll be pausing very, very often to kind of share my thoughts with you guys and apply whatever we're reading back to these generalized strategies that we started going over. Obviously on test day and when I'm taking a test, I don't stop my thought process, but I'm doing this for you guys to sort of get an inside look at what it is from my perspective um, as somebody who has a lot of experience taking these exams. Um, so that's kind of going to be the, the flow of events here, okay? Um, all right, so these are from the test that Mrs. Uh, Francis Queller emailed out to all of you. It's also the DOE um, test A, form A. Um, so the first passage is called Scribe Like an Egyptian for whoever wants to open it up and, and follow along. Um, okay, so and also, I'll, also, I'll also add this into the chat. Every single person should already have this. Um, so I'm just reminding you, this is the released exam from the Department of Education. So this is an open um, item. So please keep that in mind. And this is already in the email and in the text message. So you should have it. We will also put it into the chat. Go ahead. Okay, so the very first thing that I always do is I read the title because that's going to give me a lot of information. Here we have a keyword excerpt. So I know um, that this is going to be a piece of something that I'm reading that's taken from something else. And then it's scribed like an Egyptian. So, so far right now, I, I don't exactly know the, um, like, I don't know the genre yet because I didn't start reading. Um, but just looking at the structure here um, and seeing that we have like years given to us, I don't see a lot of quotations or like character names or anything like that. Um, my best guess would be that this is likely going to be a nonfiction passage. And then you can always look at the citation and it's from history today. So we know that we're sort of reading like similar to a journal article or something that we would read for school or from a newspaper. Does that make sense? So all of this is kind of um, all this information I'm taking in right away and I'm changing the mindset of how I'm going in, um, how, what I'm thinking about as I'm going to start reading this. And obviously I'm going to be thinking about 
the nonfiction column of that note page that we just took as I go in reading this. Okay, so we're gonna start. So it says, in ancient Egypt, literacy was the key to success. However, contrary to popular belief, not all Egyptian scribes understood hieroglyphics. So what I'm noticing right away and what you guys should notice is transition words in a passage. So however is a transition word and it's signifying contrast to me. So in my brain right away, I'm thinking, I was told an idea that literacy is the key to success in ancient Egypt. And then I have an idea that's contrary to that right away. Um, and then I have this point that, oops, sorry. That many relied instead on simpler hieratic, hieratic script for the multitude of everyday documents generated by the Egyptian bureaucracy. And then they define bureaucracy for us down here. So like I told you guys, in a structured passage, your thesis is usually going to be the last sentence of your first body paragraph. So this to me is telling me that this is the main idea. This is what I'm going to be reading about. That literacy was important for success, but actually most scribes don't know, don't understand hieroglyphics and literacy is being able to read and write. So most scribe, scribes weren't able to, but instead they relied on this other hieratic script that we're introduced to. So that's what the most of the passage is going to be about, this other script, perhaps. Okay, so then we have the next body paragraph that starts hieroglyphics and hieroglyphs, and they translate it for us, the word of God. So anything in quotations, I highlight and or I underline, I pay attention to in some sort of way. Um, because there's always a reason the author chose to quote it, right? The same way if there's any change in fonts, if there's anything italicized, if there's anything bolded, you're going to pay special attention for that because none of that is accidental. So the question is, why is the author doing that? Okay, so compose a writing system with more than 1,000 distinct characters, the meaning of which were lost for 1,500 years before they were deciphered by Jean-Francais Champollion in 1822. Okay, so this is my topic sentence. So if there's any questions about hieroglyphs, um, this is the body paragraph that I'm going back to, right? So you wanna make yourself a little roadmap of where you're going to go back to should they ask you certain questions about certain things. So hieroglyphs are gonna be discussed in my first body paragraph. The other thing that I recommend is anytime you guys have years, I usually square them or you guys can circle them however you want. I try to make my annotations systematic. So that's what's really important for me. So I underline things that are main. I highlight usually like topic sentences or thesis statements. I circle things like um, transition words, um, anything quoted, anything to pay attention to. And then I square dates. So again, you don't have to use this same coding that I use for myself, but you wanna have like a generalized coding in your head because the idea of annotating is to make it easy for you guys to go back into the passage and be able to find information that you already read the first time does that make sense so i like squaring years because if there's a question that asks me about a certain year when i go back to the passage i don't have to like you know look through the whole thing and be nervous and be like i know i read this here where is it was it in this paragraph was it in that paragraph it's easy for me to systematically go okay squared is this the year no squared is this the year no squared is this the year no so everything is about efficiency and saving yourself time because then you can use the extra time that you save more efficiently to go over things um to go over things that you can actually fix. Does that make sense? Because the goal is to do well on the test. So you wanna be very, very systematic with what you do. So one of the, the things that I do is have a code for myself in the way that I annotate. Okay, so let's keep reading. Including both ideograms, which convey a whole word or idea, either concrete or abstract in a single sign, and phonograms representing either an alphabetic sound or a group of consonants. Okay, so we have more definitions, right? We're breaking down the system of hieroglyphs. We know when it was deciphered, by who it was deciphered. We know how long it was lost for, and we know that it includes both ideograms and phonograms, and we have a definition for both of those. The writing system was used in formal inscriptions on tomb and temple walls, as well as on elaborate fenerary, fenerary papyri. And again, we have a definition for this, which is just a sheet of papyrus containing religious images. For everyday purposes, however, scribes used a shorthand version of the hieroglyphic script known as a hieratic. 
And the reason I'm circling this is because we're going back to something that I think is my thesis, which was quicker to write and more economical of space. The two writings existed side by side for at least 2,500 years. So we're learning a little bit more about the hieratic. We know that it's quicker, so that's important. And we know that it's more economical, meaning it takes up less space on the paper. And then we also have the relationship between hieroglyphs and hi hieratic. So that's how this paragraph ends. So relationship between hieroglyphs, which is how this paragraph started, and hieratics, or this hieratic script. And notice that because this paragraph ends with this, my suspicion is that the next paragraph is going to begin with this, right? So it's all about like transitioning. Why is the author making this connection now? Because the next paragraph is probably going to take care of this newer idea that we're mentioning about the hieratic script. And look what it is, scraps of ancient hieratic writing, mostly penned by students scribe on limestone flakes, suggest that no matter how humble his origins, an educated Egyptian could achieve almost anything. So we've got our new, our new topic sentence, and it shows basically this paragraph is going to be about hieratic writing and how um, even if somebody comes from nothing, they can basically use literacy to work up the ladder. So maybe I would write something like achievement here or success, something small to remind myself that it's not just about the hieratic script, but also about moving through society using literacy. Homer Hebb, and then we have a year, is a good example. Born of middle ranking parents, his scribal training led to an army career from scribe of recruits during the reign of Akhenaten, we got a new year. Homer Hebb rose through the military ranks and by the rule of Tutankhamun, a new year, he was commander in chief of the Egyptian forces. As a close advisor of the young Pharaoh, Homer Hebb was appointed deputy of the king. Of the king throughout the two lands and might have expected to succeed to the throne should the king die childless. He had to wait a few years, but eventually Homer had achieved the pinnacle of his career by becoming the last king of the 18th dynasty, making his mark by instituting dramatic reforms to the organization of the army, the judiciary and admission administration in general. The lasting success of these changes owed much to his scribal background. So this whole paragraph is giving us an example of how somebody rose from very like low ranks, middle ranking parents all the way up to king. And the author is saying that the reason he was able to do that and the reason he was successful is partly because of his scribal background, partly because he was able to have uh, proficiency in hieratic writing. But education was not available to all. So here's our new, the new direction the author is taking us, right? So this paragraph was saying through literacy, people are able to move up the ladder, but we have this contrast again, right? Transition words, like I mentioned before, but education was not available to all. So limitations basically is what this paragraph is going to talk about. Limitations of this ability to rise up the ladder. Government departments and major temples supported schools where boys commenced their training at six or seven, sometimes earlier. To these boarding establishments, family or household servants delivered the students food and drink rations daily for several years, during which time the student was not contributing to the family's income. Boys from poorer families could only hope to be educated with support from a wealthier relative or patron or through apprenticeship to an older scribe, perhaps the local clerk or land agent who could teach them the basics of the scribe's craft. This limited the scope for employment, but such on the job training allowed apprentices to help out at home while learning. So again, this is just talking about limitations. Next paragraph, scribal education began with the elementary principles of the hieratic script. So this is going to take us through scribal education step by step. The lowliest scribes who trained for just five or six years probably learned only the rudiments, and if that's complicated for you, you can just replace it, only the basics, of the hieroglyphic script. Students were set exemplar documents and extracts from popular text to copy to practice their hieroglyph hieratic handwriting on basic format letters, reports, and contracts while absorbing the good advice contained in text. Surviving examples of copy work sometimes include tutors' corrections added in red. Some significant Egyptian literary works survive almost exclusively from student copies. So here we're learning about the importance of the student copies for us to have information now. And then finally, the last 
paragraph, a schoolboy dictionary of hieroglyphs with their hieratic equivalents shows that a knowledge of more than 450 signs was required for everyday writing purposes. So this is going to tell us everyday writing, right? So how much do you need to know to be proficient? Lessons in record keeping and filing and labeling enabled any half competent scribe to perform that most essential of all scribal functions, the making and updating of lists. Notice half competent, right? So there's a connotation to that, right? So you could say, you could just say the word competent, you can say the word incompetent. Half competent is like, if they're at least like a little bit good, does that make sense? So the author is kind of giving us an idea of, of their tone, the way that they're writing this passage using a word like that. For professions such as those of government official, priest or lawyer, a scribe would train for several more years, increasing his vocabulary to perhaps a thousand or more signs. So 450 is basic writing pro, um, 450 is like basic, right? Writing for everyday purposes. And then a thousand or more if you're this professional, either a priest or a lawyer or a scribe. And those with the best handwriting or drawing skills might follow the craft of creating beautifully illustrated copies of funerary texts, commonly called books of the dead. Others could become droughtsmen, artists, or architects. Doctors compiled their own collection of medication recipes, treatments, associated incantations, many copied from texts found in the House of Life, the temple library. Lawyers had to be familiar with the corpus of civil and religious laws and precedents found in official records, which were administered by archivists. Egypt's bureaucratic society depended on the skills of scribes of all ranks from filing clerk to tax assessor for young Egyptians, be a scribe was the best piece of career advice. So I'm highlighting and I'm circling this last piece because what are we doing? We're sort of restating the whole point of the passage. We're restating the thesis. The idea of if you become a scribe in ancient Egyptian society, you're able to move through the ranks of, of the society. You're able to move up. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this first page because people are asking to take a screenshot of the notes. So I'll go back for a second. Anybody have any generalized questions after we read this first passage together? Either on this passage specifically, any vocab words you guys didn't understand, the way I annotated it or the way that I, I work through it. Any questions at all before we go to the questions? Olga, can you also add a note just about prior knowledge? Because I think some students, I just want to put everyone's mind at ease. You don't have to have prior knowledge on this topic. If you could please just add to that. Of course. So there's absolutely no prior knowledge. In fact, I think having prior knowledge might be a disadvantage. You guys shouldn't use any prior knowledge that you have. If you happen to do a project on scribes or Egyptian or whatever else, your answers, the answers that they want you to pick are all in the passage. So you need to use the information they're giving you to formulate a best answer. Does that make sense? Um, let's take a look at the questions. Oh, and there's a there's a figure here. So there's not gonna be a figure with every passage. If there is, you 100% wanna look at it. And there's usually gonna be just one question on the figure. But you always wanna pay attention to it because it's usually like an easy, easy question. Um, so it gives us, this is the social structure. Um, it shows us the pharaoh or the king is on top. Then we have nobility and priests, traders, shopkeepers, scribes, and artisans. So it shows you where scribes are, right? So the reason I'm going to highlight scribes or circle scribes is because the passage we just read is about scribes. So basically, this is how high up in society you are able to become if you become a scribe. And the story they told us in the second body paragraph is how somebody was able to go from here, where his family was from here, he was able to become a scribe. And based on his education, he was able to go all the way up, right? So it's also important for you guys to constantly think like the test maker if i was a test maker why am i putting in this this figure into this passage right so you want to relate it back to yourself to what you just read and you want to interpret it in the context of what you just read and sort of predict what can they possibly ask me using the information i read plus this figure all right so let's go ahead and go to the questions <clears throat> and <clears throat> go from there all right, so we have the first question. Which sentence from the excerpt 
best supports the idea that there were different levels of education for a scribe. So different levels of education for a scribe was kind of given to us in the last uh, few paragraphs, right? This is the paragraph. Look what I wrote here. I wrote scribal education. So if I want to go back to something, I know that my answer is likely going to be in this paragraph. The, this is the paragraph that's talking about the different education. This one and this one together. Both of them, five and six. Um, so let's see. So just based on that, there's only one answer choice that's from one of those paragraphs, right? So if I was running low on time and I really had no idea, I would jump to just that choice and I would read this. And if this makes sense, I would keep going and I would put a little dot for myself and the dot would tell me, okay, you did this really quickly, go back if you have extra time. Does that make sense? So the same way that I have a coding system for annotation, I have a coding system for like management of my time into which questions do I go back to? So like, I usually put a star if I'm like, okay, this was a really hard question for me. It was a guess. It's like, I couldn't even narrow anything down. Um, big problem. I definitely need to go back. Then I have this where it's like, I'm pretty sure I have the right answer, but I did it very quickly. So I wanna go back to double check. I have this when it was a 50-50, right? So I was able to like narrow down to 50-50 and then I had to kind of like guess, I wasn't sure. And then I put nothing if I'm like pretty certain that's the right answer. So that, that one I would not go back to unless I really had extra, extra time and I was able to go through all of these questions first, right? So again, it's about efficiency. You don't want to just be like circling and starring and questioning things. And then the test ends and you're like, oh my God, where do I go back to? Where, where do I begin, right? So you wanna have a systematic way for yourself um, to go back to things. And on the scrap paper, usually like I'll put like stars and I'll list myself like question 17, question 21, question 30, dot question one, seven, nine, something like that. And the point of doing that is you're going to even save yourself the few minutes of like having to list through your whole test booklet and say, oh my God, where was that question where I put a star and I didn't know? Does that make sense? So every little thing that you guys can do to save time will make you a more efficient test taker. Okay, so let's check out these answer choices. So choice A says, contrary to all popular beliefs, not all Egyptian scribes understood hieroglyphics for everyday purposes. However, scribes used a shorthand, limited scopes of employment, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is telling us different levels of education for a scribe, right? Because a scribe would train for several more years so it's telling us about different hierarchies within scribes. Does that make sense? Some scribes trained a lot. Some scribes didn't train a lot. Again, in paragraph six, they talked about how for basic knowledge, you only needed 450 signs. And for those that would train more, they would train for several more years. Those are the more professional people in more professional fields, right? So by explaining that certain professions required additional years of training and scribing, this paragraph supports the idea that there was different levels of education within the scribes themselves. Does that make sense? So it works. Annotating the passage efficiently works because without even having to go through the other choices, I know where that answer should be. And because they tell us the paragraphs, it's kind of giving away the answer for us. Does that make sense to everybody? Was anybody stuck on A, B, and C and want me to go more into why that's not a good answer? Olga, I'm also going to put the explanations into the chat. This way, they'll also see the DOE explanations. So they'll see strategies and both. Okay. So everyone, please check the chat box. You'll be able to see that as well. Okay. Um, I also want to just add, when, if I could really quickly right now, when the question says which answer from the excerpt best supports the idea, please take the word best. Um, Olga, if you could please take that word, just circle it and stab it, injure it, hurt it. Okay. We don't want to use the word best, which excerpts 100% supports the idea. So everyone remember um, from A, B, C, and Z, one is correct and the other three are incorrect. So let's get rid of the word best. And we're going to say which sentence from the excerpt sub 100% supports this idea. And it's choice A, B, C, or D from there. Okay. So just remember that. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. The next one, reading the sentence from paragraph two. So right away, I remember that in paragraph two, um, this was the paragraph that taught me all about hieroglyphics, right? So it's all about going back to your 
um, roadmap. So I know kind of where I'm at at the passage. So it says, including both ideograms, and then we have the definition of ideograms. They convey a whole word or idea, either concrete or abstract in a single sign, and phonograms representing either an alphabetic sound or a group of consonants. The writing system was used in formal inscriptions on tomb and temple walls, as well as on elaborate funerary papyri. So this was basically telling us, um, telling, giving us a more of a definition of how like what was included in hieroglyphs they're further explaining to us the concept of hieroglyphs so explain that hieroglyphs were reserved for royal and religious purposes so this one should be easy to eliminate because they specifically say that this is not the only reason for hieroglyphs right they say they could be used for formal inscriptions on tomb or temper walls or they could be just on elaborate funerary papyri. And funerary papyri, if you guys remember, was, um, was defined for us here. So there's nothing that tells us that it needs to be reserved for a royal purpose or for a religious purpose. And then later on in the passage, they also describe how they um, were used in like everyday purposes as well. So this is definitely not true. Next, demonstrate the methods used to interpret hieroglyphs. So again, this is incorrect because this just tells us about the types of hieroglyphs, ideograms or phonograms. It doesn't actually teach us how to interpret the meaning of these things. It just is telling us that this is like a form of alphabet that contains both ideograms and phonograms. So this is not true. Next, clarify the significance of hieroglyphs in language and literature. Again, not true. Um, they explain that what they're used for, right? But they don't tell us about, um, about the significance of them and they don't mention literature at all. And then finally, describe the basic features of hieroglyphs and how they were typically used. True, and again, this goes back to our roadmap, right? That's what this whole paragraph was, was meant to do. Explain to us what are hieroglyphs. Define to us what are hieroglyphs. When are they used? What are they made up of? And that's exactly what the sentence from paragraph two is doing. So if you always refer back to your roadmap, you'll get to your right answer. Okay, next, which sentence um, statement summarizes the process that schools use to train scribes? So how did schools use to train scribes? Where in the passage did we talk about tri scribal training? Again, like we already said for this paragraph, the training of scribes was in paragraphs five and six. So I know that my answer here is going to be in paragraph five or six. Okay. Next, boys had to memorize around 450 hieratic signs. Once they had learned these, they were expected to copy literary texts that contained valuable lessons. Okay, so the 450 hieratic signs is sort of a hint to us, right? We know where that number comes from. That number came from the sixth paragraph. So now we have to think, is that how they train them? Is that what happened? They said, learn 450 and then go on to copy things. No, they, they're saying that 450 signs are required for basic competence in everyday writing. So what the authors or, of this exam are doing right here is they're throwing you a bone with the 450 hieratic signs because that's something memorable. It's a number. We read it. Um, just because you see the same words that are in the passage, you have to think, is the author misinterpreting this for me, right? And they are. They're using information that is in the passage, but they're using it incorrectly. It's not that boys had to memorize the 450 signs. It's just that you need at least 450 to be competent in just day-to-day -day communication to be a scribe. So I don't even care what it says after this. It doesn't matter if this sentence is true, if it's not true, if it's correct. None of that matters because this is just simply false. Once you find the author contradicting something in the passage or a false statement, you don't need to think about anything else in that choice. That's not the right choice. So just based on this, this is incorrect. The author is misinterpreting that 450 hieratic signs thing and using just that word, 450, just the number to sort of like fool you guys into, oh, you recognize that number, you think that's the right answer, but it's wrong. Okay, next, boys spent at least five years learning hieratic signs, which they practiced by copying tests. And during this period, they were also introduced. Okay, so in paragraph five, they say that they trained for five or six years, the lowliest scribes. So boys had to learn five, 
to train for five to six years just to learn the basics. So, so far, so good. And then after that, um, they would copy in writings. After that, they would use exemplar documents and extracts from popular texts to copy. And the reason they're doing that is for their handwriting. That's the purpose of that. So now if we look at this choice, um, yes, which they practice by copying text. So, so far B is good. Um, next, boys spent five or six years learning the basics. This is true. After this period, they could become apprentices and begin learning hieroglyphics. So to decide between B and C, it's just this part that differs. So that's what we need to focus on. Um, so if we go back to paragraph five, um, we have to see what they say about that. It says, learning the rudiments, the basics of hieroglyphic script. So it seems like at the same time, they were also learning hieroglyphic script. Um, so that's why we know that choice B is correct and choice C is not correct because those things were happening um, at the same time. And, then and Olga, can you take a second, just highlight exactly in the passage where that's stated. And then after question 20, I wanna do a deep dive. I will um, take a moment to do a deep dive for those last three questions. Sure, so it's right here. I'm gonna highlight it in purple. So trained for five or six years, probably learned only the rudiments of hieroglyphic years. So that means that they trained for five or six years, that's true. And they also learned basic hieroglyphs, which is all in that one sentence that I highlighted in purple. And we can also put the line number here, just so when you guys are going back to restudy this, you know exactly where to look. So the answer is in paragraph five, second sentence. Okay, and then the last option here, boys were learned, were taught two different scripts. They practice both types. Again, this is just um, incorrect. Although th they correctly explain that they learned two types of incorrect, two types of scripts, the hieratic signs and the hieroglyphs, um, the latter part is not true in the sentence because they were copying exemplar texts, not copying lists. So this is the part that's untrue. And I said, if one part of the answer choice is not true, then we can cancel the whole thing out. So your choice here should have really been between B and C. You should have been able to narrow down between B and C. And then you should think, okay, so the only difference between this is this part. And then the answer to distinguish between this part, the answer was right here in that line that I highlighted in the second sentence in paragraph five. Okay. Um, any questions thus far? Okay, so then Francis, if you wanted to jump in, like you said, for the last few questions. So what I'm thinking is, can you do, you'll do question, you know what, actually, let me, let me just do 18 and 19. Is that okay? And then you will take yeah. over from there. Sure. Okay, so everyone, let's go back to 18. So I want to do a deep dive with wording and we'll refer to this uh, as wishy-washy wording. And I actually wanna share with you, and I'm speaking for Olga and speaking for myself. So those of you who know, I am an attorney outside of running Queller when I sat for my LSAT exam. The LSAT had a reading comprehension passage. When I sat for my bar exam, it had multiple reading comp passages. So I've done quite a lot of analytics in terms of this. And Olga, if you could please also add which exams you've taken high stakes that have had these kinds of passages. Yeah, so I've taken the SHSAT, obviously, the SAT, then the MCAT to get into med school, and then most recently, my first medical board, step one. And believe it or not, these skills even apply to step one, which is like a very scientific exam, but still being a good reader and a good test taker even helps in that, in those cases as well. So, Olga, just to be clear, you started, you know, practicing reading comp, let's say, for SHSAT seventh grade, and you're actually how old right now? 24. 24 and you're still using these same reading strategies. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone pay attention. So here it says, read the sentence from paragraph two, right? So don't go to one, don't go to three, go to two. Good, so we'll put a heart around two. Good, Olga, she'll draw for me. Okay, ready? The author's purpose, between the word author and between the word purpose, there's an imaginary word. Ready? Guess what Guess what number we're going to put? Are we going to write the word 99 or 100? What are we going to write? A 99 or 100? We are going to write 100. The author's 100% purpose, 
for including this sentence. Got it? It's not a maybe answer. The right answer here is H and the word basic. I'll put the word, uh, can I put um, a heart next to it? Okay. I really, you, you really want to have a simple, soft answer because you need to be 100% right. Got it? Okay. And E, it says here, explain hieroglyphs for reserve, for royal and religious, only royal and reserved and religious purposes. It's really like intense to say that it's only reserved for that one purpose, right? So the, I wouldn't pick that. So that's the word, right? Good. Demonstrate the methods experts use. No, I don't like that expert used to interpret too much, too much. I really like H. Look at the word basic. Basic is a good typically. Can we put a heart next to the word typically? Typically. Good. Basic. Look at how good those words are. Those are like wonderful words. Like I love those words. The author's 100% purpose. See that? Because it has to be right. Good. 19. Which statement summarizes? Ready? Between the word statement and summarizes, let's use our magical invisible ink. And what number do you think has to go between the word statement and summarizes? 85, 95, 99, 100. Which statement 100% summarizes the process that schools use to train? The 100%. Do you see that? Yes. Do we see that? Yes. Um, B, boys spent at least five years as hieroglyphs, which they practice. By co it's like really like simple, soft, basic. Ooh, look at that. Where are we going to put a heart? Guess where we're putting a heart, everyone? 18H and 19 B. I love these moments. It's all about the patterns. Ready? By the way, I'm not saying that whenever you see the word basic, pick it. I just happen to notice a coincidence that soft wording tends to win. I'll tell you which wording doesn't win. And Olga, you'll do this, of course, um, at the end if you haven't already. Um, Olga, can, can you please read what are, um, I'm trying to think, what are some examples of extreme basic. wording? Always, never, Always. let's put like only let's just can we just write like some words like there's some words that are just like not good right i will always do a it's going to be wrong because what if you do b on tuesday right so you all you don't want to always say something or never say something can we put like a no smoking sign like a circle and a and a, and a slash no we're not going to say this is bad don't pick these words always never like when you know a hundred percent yes or a hundred percent no don't pick those answer choices. They're extreme. Avoid extreme wording. And in general, when you speak, like you don't want to get sued when you speak. You never want to say like extreme, like this. I'm definitely going to get this to happen. No. What are some good words? Basic. Oh, wait, let's go over some bad words again. Solely, only. Those words are bad words. Avoid those words. 100% yes. 100% no. Anything that sounds firm and concrete, avoid those answer choices. What are some good answer choices? It may, M-A-Y. It can, C-A-N. Typically, sometimes. These are good answer choices. Okay, Olga, if you could please go to 20 and then I'll chime in after that, okay, once you're ready. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for butting into the webinar, Olga. I just wanted to join. And I have another one at seven, so I'm super wired. We have a Macaulay College one coming up in an hour. So the button for Ms. Queller is on. All right, keep going. Sure. Um, so I'm just taking notes on everything that Ms. Francis shared. So you guys have everything on the page also. All right, so let's move to 20. So which claim is best supported? again, by the information presented in paragraphs three and four. So we go back to our roadmaps and what is paragraph three and four about? So paragraph three and four was about hieratic writing, about how we can use the scribe to move up our ladder, our society ladder, and then about the potential limitations of that, how not everybody was able to have access to education to become a scribe. So let's see, um, based on just those, that information of the main ideas of those paragraphs, let's see um, what our answer is. So education was difficult for common citizens of Egypt to obtain. So there is a paragraph on limitation, right? Paragraph four is talking about limitations. However, is, is it telling us that common citizens had difficulty getting an education? No, because it talked about 
poorer families. So it's not necessarily that common citizens are the same as poorer families. Does that make sense? So um, this, like Ms. Francis is talking about, is one of those extreme choices. This is sort of like holding in, like holding us into the corner, right? It's not, it's, it's a fallacy of extremity because while the author did mention some limitations, some difficulty in obtaining education for poor people, we can't go ahead and apply that same idea to all the common citizens, right? So notice again, the language, all the common the common citizens of Egypt is like saying everybody that lived there, most people that lived there. So that's way too extreme of a choice. So that's not it for us. Um, next, once students began studying to become scribes, their future held more possibilities. Absolutely. This was our whole topic sentence of paragraph three. They gave us this whole example of this one guy, Homer Hebb, who had humble origins and he became a scribe and then he worked his way all the way up to king. And that's exactly what the thesis in this paragraph says. And right here, I'm going to highlight it. This is our topic sentence of this paragraph, and it gives us the answer. No matter how humble his origins, an educated achievement could an educated Egyptian, excuse me, could achieve almost anything. So that's exactly what choice B is telling us that once students became scribes, their future held more possibilities. They could achieve almost anything, like becoming king. So F is our answer here. If someone wanted to become a scribe, support from outside sources, such as the government or a temple was necessary. Again, this is not true. They're using one detail where they mention that sometimes the poorer boys who couldn't afford to become a scribe needed, um, needed extra help, but that's not anybody. So if someone, again, this is way too extreme. It's too extreme, it's too general. They're taking a detail that was stated to you and they're pigeonholing it. Does that make sense? So that's a very common wrong answer. So do not fall for that. And then finally, becoming a successful scribe required a student's family to sacrifice time and money. Again, required is another one of those very, very strong words and that's not necessarily true. Um, although there are certain sacrifices that were necessary for poorer people, but in normal common citizens, this was not necessary. So this question is actually a really good example to avoid all the extreme sort of choices, even if they're not directly using those words, they're extreme ideas, does that make sense? So it's just an offshoot of a similar concept that Mrs. Keller was just teaching us that we need to avoid and not fall for those examples. Okay, any questions? And then can we do a deep dive in this also? All right, is everyone with me? So I'm putting stuff into the chat right now. Just a moment, I wanna, uh, I'm typing in right now. So these are extreme words, I'm typing this in. Okay, good, everyone has it in the chat. All right, so let's take a look. Which claim, so question 20, um, while I have it here right now, everyone, let's just take a moment, okay? Which claim is best supported by the information? So which claim is between the word is and between the word best? What is the word that you really number? Do you want to have the number 40, 50%? What percent accuracy are you going for? You have choices, right? E, F, G, and H. One is 100% right. And the other ones are 100% wrong. So the only number you should be putting here is 100%. Which claim is 100% supported? Which claim is 100% entirely supported, entirely accurate? And Olga, if you could just go through these one more time so that it's very clear for everyone, and then I will reiterate what you're saying right now. Sure, so choice A, education was difficult for common citizens of Egypt to obtain. So common citizens is a gross overgeneralization here. They're taking one supporting detail from the passage and they are making it way bigger than it is. The words that they're playing on is this passage is, is right here in, um, in paragraph four, where they say that uh, for poor students, things were more complicated. Um, right here, one second. Boys from poorer families could only hope to be educated from support or through apprenticeship. So poorer families needed extra help. Does that make sense? Versus common citizens did not. So education was difficult for poorer Egyptians to obtain. That's true. 
common citizens is a gross overgeneralization. So we're avoiding the overgeneralization. They're taking something true or changing one tiny thing about it that makes it not true, that makes you cross out that answer choice. So we are eliminating E because of that fact. Next, we're looking at F. Once students began studying to become scribes, their future held more possibilities. This is exactly the topic sentence of paragraph three. This is the very first highlight, this purple highlight right here um, that I highlighted for us to look at. So this right here. And then I'm also going to type in exactly what they're saying from the DOE. And then we're also going to go into targeted wording. And what I want to do is locate a pattern. So let me just send this right now. I'm going to type this in. Okay, just one moment. I'm putting this in the chat. Okay, for 20. So when it says best supported, what we're going to do, and again, I'm putting this into the chat right now. When it says best supported, don't look for a 99% accurate answer. Look for the answer that will give you 100% accuracy. So which, not 20, which claim is best supported by the information presented in paragraphs three and four? Don't look at paragraph one. Don't look at paragraph two. What is presented? Okay. So here we're looking at F. Once students began studying to begin to become scribes, their future held more possibilities. One possibility is enough for this entire answer to be correct. Is everyone following? Good? Yes? Do you see the next one after F? You see G, if someone wanted to become a scribe, support from outside sources such as the government or a temple was necessary. Let's like get rid of it, that's like bad. How can you say that like you must do something? You must, you absolutely must have support from the government or you must have support from the temple. This is a bad answer choice. Look at a, becoming a scribe required a student's family. It must happen. This word, it was required. What if it's not required? What if a thousand times it's required and then a thousand and one it's not required? By default, the answer is wrong. Everyone, remember, and, and also who are we to judge? What a successful scribe or who a successful scribe is and why must it be required? It's a very definitive, firm, avoid firm answers. Look at how light, look at how airy choice F is. Do you see that? It just, it just held more possibilities, right? Look up at the clouds. You have more possibilities. You have more options. How can you possibly say that's a wrong answer? There's no way that answer is going to be the wrong answer. I'm going to read what the DOE says also in paragraph three. The author provides an example of a person who uses skills as a scribe. And then it says here, the author continues in paragraph four to explain that with proper support, some young Egyptians could become educated, thereby opening more opportunities for themselves. Do you see how light and airy and simple, keep it simple, keep the answer, uh, if you could even write it down actually, I'll go, keep it simple, keep the answer choices as simply worded as possible. Simple, keep the answers simple. Don't offend, don't insult, don't say it must be one way. Keep the answers simple. Okay, where it says which claim is best supported, you know for sure the answer has to be a simple answer because it has to be correct. The correct answer is generally one that cannot be wrong. It, it, you can't. And, and here, the other answer choices, are, they're just wrong. They're wrong. Becoming a, success, a successful scribe requires this type of family to sacrifice, it's too, it's wrong. The wording is wrong. Olga, if you could please just elaborate on this and then we'll move on. Yeah, exactly. This goes back to the idea of must, of always ne necessary, required, um, anything where they're playing on a detail that they gave you and then they're trying to apply that one detail to everything is generally wrong. And they're using details that they mentioned in the passage to try to get you to fall for it. But then you want to look at the red flags, the necessary, the required, and then those should make you go get away from them. 
And then additionally, the language of the right answer will match the language of the passage. So choice F really almost mirrors exactly what we wrote for our roadmap here um, of this ability to move through like the classes in Egypt open more opportunities. That's what they mean. And they give you this whole example. That's what this whole paragraph is about of this middle ranking guy, Homer Heb, who became a scribe and then he became a king. So that's the exact supporting detail of this choice that we're picking, that it opened more possibilities for him. Does that make sense to everybody? So this answer is supported by the topic sentence of the paragraph. It's supported by the syntax or the language that it's using such that it's very soft. We don't use any extreme words. We're not pigeonholing. And it's supported by the supporting detail, the whole example in that passage of Homer head. Does that make sense? So all of your like sort of flags are green in that case. Does that make sense? The language matches, the place in the passage mass matches. We got the evidence from paragraph three. It matches the topic sentence and our roadmap and it matches the supporting detail. Does that make sense? So you guys shouldn't even have any doubt in your mind about what the right answer is because of all of those things. Does that make sense? I think we're good to move on. And I just want to remind you, look at the wording, look at the, choose the soft wording, avoid extreme words. It's so important. If you're pressed for time, choose the soft wording likely to happen likely. Yes, it could be true or it could not. It could go either way and use this wording. And that if you really, really are out of time, avoid extreme answer choices. All right, I am putting myself on mute. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, let's finish up this passage. So next, hieratic script was particularly valuable. So particularly to me means especially valuable, right? So what is important about hieratic script specifically in a bureaucratic government? And then you guys should remember that the word bureaucratic was actually highlighted for us. Um, and explained to us, it was one of the footnotes. So we should be able to go back to exactly where this was mentioned. Um, so many relied instead on the simple hieratic for the multitude of everyday documents generated by the Egyptian bureaucracy. So the idea here is that they were extremely valuable um, because in, back in paragraph one, and again, I knew exactly where to look because of this one footnote here tells me exactly where I need to look so I don't need to waste time. Um, it says that hieratic script is simpler for the multitude of everyday documents. And then they explain later on why that's true, because hieratic script is both quicker to write and it's more economical. So the logical conclusion based on the fact that most of the documents actually use hieratic script and hieratic script is faster to write and it's more economical, takes up less space. So all of that is, is implying to me that this hieratic script was probably more efficient for the amount of documents and the types of documents that a government was sort of generating. Does that make sense? Um, so now we have to look for the answer. So using hieratic scripts was an efficient way for scribes to produce large amounts of documentation. So based on the detail in paragraph two about how it is more economical and quicker, oops, I wrote paragraph two twice. Um, A seems like a good choice. But let's just check out the other answers to be sure. So B says many members of the general public could comprehend information that was written in the hieratic script. So this is actually not necessarily true um, because most of the people of the general public, we don't know whether or not most of the people were literate or not. Uh, we do know that there is this limitation that people who were not educated could not read or write. And this limitation was given to us in paragraph four. Um, so it's too dangerous for us to say many members because we don't know if it just said some members of the general public could comprehend information, um, that would be better. But many is a little bit like there's nothing in the passage to tell us whether it's majority or minority. And A is the stronger choice, so I wouldn't pick B. Next, C says knowledge prepared scribes to serve their society in increasingly challenging roles. 
Um, so this is a little bit too generalized, right? So scribes could basically take any role. You could just be a general scribe. You could be a lawyer, you could be a basic scribe. So we learned that there's sort of a hierarchy of scribes as well. Um, so it's not necessarily that they have to take on, on a challenging role. You don't have to take on a challenging role to be a scribe. And then finally, people from different professional backgrounds could easily communicate with one another. Although that could be true, um, there's no discussion in this passage about different professions communicating within each other. And also the question is about the bureaucratic government. So there's sort of nothing in choices B, C, or D that goes back to the bureaucratic government aspect of the question versus A does because a government would have to generate large amounts of, of documentation, right? Because they're a government, that's their whole job. Um, so you also want to connect the bureaucratic government aspect. And and this connection, this is an implication question, right? This is something that we can apply, imply from the fact that if you're a government, you have to put out lots of government documents. So A is addressing this part versus B, C, or D does not address anything to do with the government. I don't see any connection there between that and the government. It's not necessarily that people from different professional backgrounds communicating, like if an, a doctor and lawyer talk to each other and they're able to scribe back and forth, what does that have to do with the bureaucratic government? Does that make sense to you guys? So that's an additional reason to sort of eliminate choice B, C, and D. Another sort of overall strategy that can help is picking the choice that sticks out from the others, that's least like the others. So the only choice that doesn't touch uh, the only choice that does address the government part, for example, or the only choice that does not have one of those forceful words in them, like we saw in, in, the, in the question before. Okay, look what they're asking us about, the diagram, which we already looked at, best provides additional support for the topic of the excerpt by what? Um, so how does, what's the point of including that document? So that that little chart shows us where scribes were in ancient society. That's exactly what I said before I even looked at this question, right? It shows us where our scribes, right? I circled scribes and I said, this is where we are on our hierarchy. It shows us where scribes are. So it shows us how people became scribes and improved their position, how you could work from here all the way up. Um, so it shows us um, basically where scribes are and that scribes are not on the bottom of society. Now, I think the mistake that they wanted to pick, like get you guys on in this case was choice G, indicating that scribes were able to easily improve their um, social ranking. So although this is something that the passage talks about, the figure, if you just saw that diagram, you would not be able to tell me that scribes were able to easily move in their social ranking. That diagram alone only shows us where scribes are on the hierarchy. Does that make sense? It does. There's no caption. There's nothing in that diagram. There's no arrows. There's nothing to suggest that scribes were easily to move. You got that information from the passage, but this question is asking you about the diagram. So it's really important that you make that distinction as well. It's asking, how does the diagram support the passage? Does that make sense? And then finally, based on the passage, which statement would the author most strongly agree with? So this, they want us to be the author. So think as you're the author, author's perspective. So choice A says, boys in Egypt were encouraged to enter the same profession as older male relatives. So the author of the passage is only addressing scribes. So this idea talking about the same profession as other male relatives, this is too general of a choice because the author only gave us his opinion on scribes. So we have no idea what the author thinks about other professions. So we can't make any conclusion based on that. So that's why we would avoid this because that's way too general. Now B says knowledge of hieroglyphs was helpful to Egyptians who were interested in becoming scribes. So again, this question is a little bit, it's throwing us for a loop. The first of all, hieroglyphs, the very first thing they tell us is that hieroglyphs were not widely practiced. Instead, they use the hieratic script. If you go back to here, that very second sentence says, contrary to all popular beliefs, most scribes actually didn't understand hieroglyphs. So this is completely not true based on the second sentence of paragraph one.
hieratic script was more practical to ancient Egyptians than hieroglyphs were. Absolutely, this is our thesis. This was the whole point of the whole story. Um, it's mentioned at the end of the paragraph, at the, in the conclusion, and it's mentioned right here. Many rely instead on simple hieratic script. Um, so that's the whole point, that hieratic script was more practical for them to use because it's more economical, it's faster, and some scribes didn't even know hieroglyphics. So C is our answer. And then D, for only a few years, were unlikely to find employment. Again, that's not true. There's a whole paragraph about how they need to study for five and six years. This is way too like wishy-washy. Um, we don't know only a few years, how many years. And that's not true because they did find employment after studying for just five or six years. That's the whole point that becoming a scribe after you do do the, those studying, you move up, you are able to find employment. So the best answer here is C. And um, it goes back to our thesis statement, which is the last sentence in the first paragraph. And Olga, I wanna do a deep dive with these answers also. And um, I think just in terms of quality, let's really go in depth with question 21, 22, 23. All right, so question 21, hieratic script was particularly valuable. It was 100% valuable. Why was it valuable? Do you see that? Do you see how it's, it's a very clear question. So if you could just write 100%, why was it valuable? Got it? It wasn't like, medium valuable, it was 100% valuable because, and you need to choose the definitive answer, okay? And here, again, we went over the answer choices, which we'll do again, but look at choice A, using hieratic script was an efficient way. Yeah, sure, it, I can shrug my shoulders. Yeah, it's totally efficient, okay? Do you see that? Do you see how this works to produce large amounts of documentation? Good. All right, as we move on, I wanna just take a look. Um, if we could for 22, the diagram after paragraph six, best provides, you see the word best, goodbye, best, farewell, okay, goodbye. We're gonna get rid of the word best, we don't need it, 100 per, can you actually like use the black, like like literally, like stab it, like kill it, bye, kill it, bye, 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 we don't need this word, okay? It 100, farewell, not blue, that's our color, no, okay, it 100% provides, 100% provides, okay? We need something that is very definitive, we need to say, what does it absolutely do? Do you see this? All right. Demonstrating a place of scribes. You, like, just, just look at, look at the question. All right. Good. Um, 23, based on the excerpt, which statement would the author most strongly? No. Which one would the author get rid of it? Bye, 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 bye. Which statement would the author get rid of the word most? Which, wh what would the author definitely a hundred percent absolutely agree with? What would the author definitely say yes to? What would he absolutely say yes to? What would he 100% say yes to? Hieratic scripts was more practical. Yeah, I could shrug my shoulders and say, yeah, sure. Then ancient Egyptians and the hieroglyphs were, yeah, sure, this is good. Do you see this? All right. This is an answer that is nice and wishy-washy and non-offensive and clean and simple. Olga, can you just do a deep dive one more time into wording that makes sense for 21, 22, and 23, just so that we are all really um, understanding certain word choices that will make sense during the actual exam? Right. So just to review for 21, um, efficient way is one of those soft words, right? It's not saying it's the only way. It's not saying it's the best way. It's saying it's one efficient, good way for scribes to produce large amount of documentation. And again, the evidence for that is in paragraph two and in paragraph one. And you also want to remember the bureaucratic government aspect of the question. And that was one of the footnotes. So that tells you exactly where to look for the answer. So all of that for question 21. For question 22, we're just looking at the diagram. What is the point of the diagram? And choice G is too much. It, it overshoots, right? We don't get that from just the diagram. Imagine you had no idea what the passage said and you're just looking at this picture. What is? What can you extrapolate? The only thing you can extrapolate is the place of scribes in Egyptian society, choice E. And then finally, the last one, this is what our whole thesis is about. This is the only thing that the author would agree with out of these answer choices. It's more practical, hieratic script because of the economical nature of it. It saves space. 
and because it's faster to write. And then it also connects with question 21. That's why the government used it. So you can use other questions to help you with this, with this question. You, the questions go together. It's establishing a pattern, like Ms. Francis said before. Okay, so we finished our first passage. Any questions? Okay, so then what I would like to do, and then maybe we can get Francis's thoughts. Um, should we do a quick strategy on poems and then do try to do the poem in this test? Or should I just I go think I think we should do the poems strategies. Let's do strategies go and realistically let we can start the poems passage. And if we need to, um I mean, if we need to, can we extend, maybe we'll extend the webinar to like 7.15, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so let's do that. So let's just go, let's shift over to the poem passage, everyone. Let's go to the poem. We're gonna go over poem strategies and then if needed, we will extend to 7.10, 7.15 and, um, and then we will cover, I think that's, we're just gonna cover main topics. I do wanna remind you, we are gonna have a whole separate webinar dedicated to poetry, um, which we will send you that information. Um, as I'm speaking right now, I'm just thinking out loud, you know, let's do, let's do, um, yeah, like 710, is that okay? 710, 715, and we'll go through the poem passage and then we'll do, we'll stop. Okay, thank you everyone, um, go ahead. Okay, so when you guys are looking at a poem, and I'm going to try to go fast to make sure that we cover all of this. So when we're looking at a poem, the first thing that I want you to evaluate is the structure of the poem and the rhythm. So what does the poem look like? And I mean that literally. So the author will sometimes switch up like the shape of the poem. So you want to look at the general shape of a poem. And what I mean by that is the indentation of, of lines, right? So you can have a poem that just looks like this. You can have a poem that looks like this. You can have a poem that looks like this. So look at where each line begins and ends and nothing is by accident in a poem. It's all intentional. It's all part of the story. So that can all tell you, tell us something. So perhaps if my poem is about a snake, that's why it's in the shape of a snake. If my poem is about like something increasing and decreasing, maybe that's why it's in this shape. So always look at the general shape of the poem. The next thing that you wanna look at is any weird capitalization, any italicization, any um, punctuation, any of those things. So capitalization specifically of improper nouns. So what, what is an improper noun? So obviously, if I'm mentioning somebody's name, if I'm mentioning a city, that's meant to be capitalized. But if I'm capitalizing something like mother, or if I'm capitalizing something like um, chair, or son, or garden, there's a reason for that, right? These are regular nouns that we don't usually capitalize. So if the author is capitalizing something, they're doing it for a reason. Does that make sense? And your job as the reader is to figure out why is that capitalized? What is the author trying to emphasize to me by capitalizing an improper noun? What's the point? What emphasis is he trying to give? So the point of this is usually some sort of emphasis and your job is to figure out the why. Why is the author emphasizing this? And then finally, you want to think about punctuation. Punctuation, italicization, and bolding. So again, the author has control in what the stanzas look like. So pay attention to where are we placing periods? Where are we placing commas? Is the author ending a thought in the middle of a line like this and then starting a new thought here? Or is the author ending and then just new, new, new stanza, right? So all of that makes sense for a reason. The author is doing it for a reason. Your job is to pay attention to it, notice it, and then try to apply it to what you're reading about. So what is what story is the author telling me for it to make sense for him to have these abrupt short sentences and to change stanzas constantly? 
And then the last thing is rhyming schemes. So oftentimes poems rhyme, it doesn't have to rhyme. If it does rhyme, pay attention to what is the scheme? Do every, every last word, is it every other word? Um, what specifically is the rhyming scheme? So that's all about structure and rhythm. The next part in understanding the poem is actually comprehension. So what story, what is the poem actually telling me? And the thing that helps here is the title. That tells you sort of the topic. And the other thing that helps us here is don't take poems literally. Usually, usually the author is not trying to be literal. Usually the author is using a literary device such as a comparison, a metaphor, a simile, um, some personification, some hyperbole, some exaggeration. So usually we don't take poems literally, we try to understand the meaning. And then finally, this is similar to the um, fiction passage strategies that we were talking about, point of view. So look at pronouns. Again, is this first person? and we're getting a narrative, is the author telling us about themselves, or is this third person and we're getting a story? So your idea here should be narrative, personal, versus outside story. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanna focus on with poems before um, we get to the poem in this in this passage set and practice is literary devices. And this is the way that you're going to be tested on literary devices on this exam. You have to be able to interpret them. So um, similes and metaphors are comparisons. They are both comparisons. So that's how you should think of them. So a simile is a comparison using the words like or as. And a metaphor does not use the words like or as. So if I say I am working like a dog, I'm comparing myself and the way that I work to a dog. Or I can say, I, I'm a dog, but I don't literally mean I'm a dog. I'm using it in the context of I've been working so hard, it's like a dog. So usually I find that metaphors are harder for students to interpret because there's no, like with a simile, you can just kind of scan for the words like or as, um, and then you know that it's a simile, you know that you're having a comparison. But a metaphor is more sort of, you have to have an eye for it. But anytime you're reading something, you're like, oh, that doesn't literary, literally make sense. And it's a poem, you should, the, 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 lights, the light bulb should go over your head and you're like, okay, maybe this is a metaphor. So what is the author really trying to tell me? What is he comparing himself or herself to? Does that make sense? The next thing that's really big in poems is imagery. Poems and poem writers will um, attune, they will appeal to our senses. So anything that appeals to your five senses, right? So anything very descriptive. So you're looking for adjectives, descriptions, adverbs. This is the space for all of that. And then we have some other devices that I wanna at least mention here. So we have personification which is when we give human qualities to something that's non-human. So I find that authors very, very often do this with forces of nature. So that's a pattern that I've noticed from years of taking these exams. So oftentimes forces of nature will be personified. So they'll talk about like a hurricane that's like very, very intense um, or a hurricane like um, walking down the street, something like that, right? So the idea is that hurricane can't literally walk down the street, but they're using that language to kind of talk about how the hurricane came and like just 
you know, like took over the street, came running down the street, taking out the whole street or something like that. They will use it with forces of nature, like with wind, with any strong, um, strong feature like that. Does that make sense? Um, another thing that we see very common is hyperbole. So I want to make sure I touch on that. This is just an exaggeration, but uh, poem writers often use it. And there's many other ones. There is alliteration, I'll just put on the side here, which is um, when we repeat consonant sounds. Um, there's onomatopoeia, where the word sounds like the sound that it makes, like, a di like the word ding literally sounds like ding. Um, there's irony, uh, which we all kind of know what that means colloquially when two things kind of are ironic and contradict each other in, in a sense. Um, so these are sort of like the big ones. And of course, there's more that we'll go over on like the full poetry workshop. But this is kind of like a basic review crash course um, that should be enough for us to apply to the poem that we're going to look at today questions let's look at the questions that you guys put in the chat um why should we pay attention to the poem shape so the poem's shape is something they could ask you about um, and it can also uh help you understand the context right so if they're talking about like a slithering snake but they're using language that's hard for you to understand um if you see the shape of the poem is in the shape of a snake that could give you another clue to what you're actually reading about does that make sense um, because oftentimes the shape of the poem matches the story, the, the, the meaning of the poem. Um, somebody else asked, how about conflict, irony? Absolutely, those are also important devices. Um, both conflict and irony don't only come up in poems, but also in um, reading comprehension as well. Somebody said, is it more efficient to read the passage first and answer the questions? So the questions first, then read the passage. I like reading the passage first and anticipating what they will ask me. That is the best thing. And thinking of the answer choice, what I think my answer is before I even read the answer choices and then matching their choice to what I already had in my head. That way you don't fall for their tricks. Does that make sense? Um, and then last, is there going to be scrap paper? I believe they give, you have the whole booklet, which is your scrap paper. So you have like a lot of space um, to be making notes and everything. Um, I believe highlighters are not allowed. I graduated from Staten Island Technical High School. Can you give tips to identify what the author wants to say using descriptive language? So the point of using descriptive language is to describe. That's the purpose. So the idea is to describe and make us feel like we're there. So make us feel and see and hear and smell everything that they are. So they are setting the scene, the setting. Does that make sense? So usually that's the point of using imagery and descriptive language in, um, in poems. And finally, how long should it take for you to read a passage? I My timeline for you to read the passage and get through the questions is like nine minutes. I think that's ideal. That also leaves you a lot of extra time after. Okay, guys, so I want to jump to the poem just because um, we have to get out of here actually by seven. Well, let's just think it's 640 right now. What do you think is the best um, closing strategies? What do you think you want to do with the remaining 20 minutes? I don't know. I mean, we definitely have time to read the poem. I think that will just take me 10 minutes to explain. And then I can not touch on the questions. The students can try the questions themselves and we can open Sunday's webinar with going over the questions. So 10 minutes to read the poem and annotate it and then 10 minutes for general questions at the end if you wanna leave exactly at seven. Yeah, because I have, the, I have another webinar. I wanna do a hard stop at seven. Okay, perfect. Is that okay? Okay. So yes. All right, so let's go ahead and annotate this poem together using um, all of the strategies that we just learned. Um, okay, so the poem is called Bird Talk. So that's already giving us some context. And then looking at the poem, there's not a direct shape, but I definitely see three stanzas. And one thing that I'm noticing right away is that the stanzas are getting shorter, right? So the first stanza is very, very long. 
then the next stanza is a little bit shorter, and then the last stanza is the shortest. So th those are just, that's what I mean. I don't mean that you have to be crazy and like, oh my God, this line is like a little bit indented and this line has so much space here. Like, I don't mean that you need to be going crazy. I mean, general things that you can notice. Another pattern that you notice is there is this pattern of indentation. There is a clear capitalization scheme, right? Each line is capitalized. And then we this pattern sort of continues into the other stanzas, except the last one where we have no indents. So these are just general things that I noticed like 10 seconds just by looking at the poem, right? It's taking a while now because I'm addressing it and I'm explaining it out loud to you, but I wouldn't even annotate this stuff like if I was actually reading it on the test, but it's just something that I'm noticing because as I'm reading, if any of those things, I can make a connection with what I'm actually reading about, it's going to help me understand the poem better, especially if poetry is something hard for you to understand the language. Everybody can see the patterns. Does that make sense? Okay, let's start reading. And now when the branches were beginning to be heavy, it was the time when they once had said, this is the beginning of summer. So we have a quotation and we're noticing the... Um, like who's speaking to us, who is they, right? When they once said, so I'm paying attention to my pronouns. The shrilling of the frogs was not so shrill as in the first weeks after the broken winter. So, so far this sounds like something positive, right? The beginning of summer. And then they're saying the shrilling of the frogs was not so shrill. So shrill is like an irritating loud noise. So if it's not so shrill, that looks like a positive. The birds took their hops and zigzag zigzags a little more anxious, a home is a home, worms are worms. So we have this repetitive scheme here. So I'm paying attention to that. I'm thinking, what could that mean? The yellow spreads of the dandelions and buttercups reached across the green pastures. Again, something positive, right? The flowers are growing. Tee wee and tee wee came on the breezes and the graggles chuzzled their syllables. So chuzzled kind of means like almost like tickled. Um, and tee wee and tee wee is probably like the sound of the wind. Um, so notice this italics and this like sound effect. Um, that's probably what they're trying to do here. The point of this is to describe to us the sound, make us feel like we're hearing it. And it was the leaves with the strong soft wind over them that talked most of all and said more than any others, those speaking the fewest words. So what do we have here? We have the leaves are talking and the leaves are saying. So what is this an example of? This is an example of personification. I told you guys, very often with forces of nature, with plants, with weather. Um, so this is exactly what's happening here. It was the green leaves, leaves trickling out of the gaunt nowhere of winter out on the gray hungry branches. So notice what's happening. They're personifying the leaves further. You guys should all be getting an image of a naked gray branch, just like filling with leaves, like the leaves growing on it. Cause that's what the author is trying to make us picture here. It was the leaves on the branches beginning to be heavy, who said, as they said one time before, this is the beginning of summer. So what do we have here? We have a nice go around to the end, right? We learned who they are. They are the leaves. That's who was speaking to us in the beginning of the passage. And so far in the beginning of this first stanza, we are basically understanding that like summer is starting and all of these different sort of natural elements, whether they be the frogs, the flowers, the sound of the leaves, the sound of the wind is kind of communicating to us, to the world that summer is starting. Okay, we shall never blame the birds who come where the river and the road make the grand crossing and talk there sitting in circles, talking bird talk. Okay, so what do we see here? First of all, notice this capitalization. I taught you guys that anytime there's capitalization of improper nouns, we wanna figure out why that is. So what is the grand crossing? Does that make sense? Where the river and the road make the grand crossing. So I'm thinking about some intersection between a river and the road. And there we, we are imagining birds in circles talking bird talk. And of course, I'm going to pay attention to bird talk because that's the title of my poem. So obviously that's important. Does that make sense? So let's keep going. If they ask in their circle as to who is here and as to who is not here and who used to be here, or if instead of counting up last year as against this year, they count up this year as against next year and have their bird chatter about who is here this year and won't be here next year, we will never blame the birds. So this is like, what did I just read? So this is basically what they're saying. Whatever the birds are chitter chattering about, even if it makes no sense, like these last few lines that I read, 
we won't blame the birds. And then if I have put your face among leaf vases, child, or if I put your voice among bird vases, blame me no more than the blue jays. So now all of a sudden we have the personal pronoun, I, me, right? So now the author switches to I'm talking. Um, so now they're saying, so if I have put your face among the leaf faces, or if I have put your voice among the bird voices, don't blame me the same way we don't burn, blame the birds for their like random chitter chattering. Does that make sense? So this last stanza is particularly important because it kind of shifts the topic a little bit. Does that make sense? Um, and now we're talking about sort of like back to the author's own personal life. Does that make sense? Okay, so questions on this poem, generalized question, general questions in the last few minutes. And then I will open up on Sunday. Hopefully I see all of you guys back here on Sunday uh, with reviewing this poem again and doing these six uh, or seven questions that have to do with the poem. So on Sunday from 10 to 12, we'll finish this poem and then we'll go into grammar strategies. And now please use this time the last 10 minutes to ask me just any questions on anything that we talked about today, reading strategy related or um, about my experience in specialized high school, that's fine as well. Um, absolutely, I'm a big advocate of annotating. Um, to me, annotating doesn't look the same to everybody, right? So you don't have to do what I do, but you need to have a system of annotating for yourself. Absolutely, you need to have a system of annotating. One, it keeps you focused on the test as you're reading. And two, it organizes your thoughts. And that's the point of annotating for me. You want to organize your thoughts. Um, how do you identify the topic? So in a nonfiction passage, it's very easy to identify the topic. You saw how we did it. It's the last sentence or two in the first paragraph. That's your thesis. That's what the author wants to talk about. Um, in a poem, it's a little bit more difficult because you have to get through it as you keep reading. And each stanza could be a little bit different. My main thing is get something out of each stanza. What is this stanza about? Similarly, how we do for paragraphs, like create a roadmap for yourself. Um, I went to a specialized high school. Um, absolutely, you want to sum summarize the paragraphs. I would say less than a few sentences. That's a waste of time. You don't. You're not writing an essay on this, right? So I don't need you to write full sentences in your annotation. Like three, four words. Like highlights of the paragraph. It doesn't have to make perfect sense to an outsider. It has to jog your memory to what is the topic of that paragraph. Um, if I'm stuck between two answer choices, I find the difference between the answer choices. And I'm like, what is different between these two choices? And I try to find something wrong in one of those choices, even if it's like a little bit wrong, a little bit contradicting the passage, a little bit is enough for you to eliminate that whole choice. And then again, if that choice has any red flag words that we talked a lot about, um, like any of those extreme answer choices. Um, practicing timing, time yourself. Don't give yourself more than two, three minutes to read the passage. Don't give yourself more than one to two minutes per question. Uh, force yourself to stay in that timeline. Pick an answer choice and move on. If you have answer extra time at the end, you can always go back. Does that make sense? But you can't dilly-dally and spend 25 minutes on one passage, and then you're stuck later on. Um, how did I prepare for the SHSAT? Unfortunately, at that time, I did not know about color prep. Otherwise, I definitely would have been here. Um, I. I think I just practiced a lot. I read a lot. Um, I did a lot of practice tests and, and just studied for it. And at, in my time, the test was also a little bit different. So it, I think it's more important for you guys to do really well now because now that they switch the test, this test almost mirrors the SAT. So if you have this foundation now, it's going to be very simple for you guys to take these strategies and apply it to the SAT, which is really important for you guys to do well on to get into a good college. Um, in my day, this test was a little bit different. They had like a whole logical section, scrambled paragraphs, all of this stuff that wasn't so like applicable to the SAT, but the SAT is structured exactly like this. There's a math section, there's a grammar section, there's a reading comp section. So doing well in the SHSAT is really important um, because your skills will just transpire into the SAT. Um, specialized high schools, they all focus on math and science, but they also have great humanity programs. Um, my school had an amazing English program. They also have um, like sports and all the other things. So those things don't suffer. 
um, at all. And there's space for people that are interested in, in different aspects and not so much math and science as well. Um, I don't, I believe you're not allowed highlighters or colored pencils for the tests. give me tips to focus fully for three hours. Okay, I agree. This test is about building stamina. So you want to work your way up to building stamina. If you're taking a practice test every week or two, twice a week, on test day, it'll just feel like another practice test. So that's exactly what we do here at Color Prep. Like every two weekends or every three weekends, you guys are administered a full test because you want to work up your stamina. You want to build your stamina, right? So this test is difficult because it's three hours. Eventually, like the MCAT is seven hours. Your boards are about eight hours if you go into medicine. So things get longer and longer and longer. And you can't just wake up and decide, okay, today I'm going to focus for eight hours and take an eight hour exam. It's something that you have to build gradually. So if you're not not sitting down for a full three hour legitimate in testing conditions practice test, you have to start doing that ASAP to prepare yourself for that stamina. Um, when is it okay to skim? I will usually say that it's okay to skim in the grammar section often because you're not reading those passages for like understanding what's going on. You're just reading it for grammar. So that's something that I really focus on in the grammar section. I'll talk more about it on Sunday. For the reading passages and poems, I usually try not to skim at all unless you have a like a specific situation where you have a big time issue that we can't fix before test day or, um, or for, for some reason you're running out of time on test day. Um, yeah, Staten Island Tech was my first choice because my family lived there at the time. You have three hours for the um, SHSAT. Are specialized high schools really stressful? Um, I had a very positive experience. You have a lot of support. Um, it could be stressful at times because you're taking a lot of AP classes, but it's also like you're creating a, a, a system for yourself of a lot of people that are very successful. And you have this system for yourself of, of older students that went to that high school that are successful, that may be interested in doing whatever you guys are interested in doing for a career. So it's just really a good system of establishing peers um, that are in the same sort of like interest boat as you. I had a really positive experience um, with my high school. If you're ever overwhelmed, there's always people that you could talk to, but high school, my high school really prepared me for college. Like I never had any difficulties in college. And in fact, I even found that like my first year or two of college before like I focused on medicine, were actually easier than high school. Like I was more studying more in high school than I was in college. And that's a really good feeling. You wanna be prepared for college um, as a lot of things are changing in your life at that time. So it's really important to be prepared, to know how to be a good student, to know how to study and specialized high schools will really prepare you for that. If you don't finish the test and time is about to end, what would I recommend? I recommend that you bubble in random answers um, because by chance, a guess, at least some of them will be correct. Do not leave anything blank on this test. How many questions? I think there's 57 questions on each on, on uh, total reading and grammar and math. How would I stop my stress during the exam? We're going to have a whole thing about stress reducing guidelines and things that you can do. Um, but just anything that gets you into a good mental workspace, um, practicing before, knowing that you guys are prepared, getting a good night's sleep, trying to eat. I have a hard time eating before test myself, but trying to put at least something in your body because our brain runs on sugar and we need energy to think. Um, what amount of time do you think should be spent on each part of the test? Um, I mean, it should be 50-50 ideally, but it's also depending on what's your strong area, what's your weak area. You guys have the advantage to start uh, with whatever section that you want. And I think that that's a really big advantage and you should use that. And the fluidity of going through sections and the fluidity of the time on this test, you should always use that to your advantage. Um, because on other tests, like you just have 20 minutes for the section. Once it ends, you can't go back. So you have to use this uh, to your advantage. Um, if you don't understand what the question wants, how do you answer them? You look for keywords, you eliminate anything that's over generalized or extreme, even if you don't understand what the answer, what the question's asking you, you know that those words can't be in the answer choice. Um, and then usually you just have one answer left. And also like just based on location, 
um, of a lot of the questions are chronological. So that's a big hint. You don't have to live in Staten Island to go to Staten Island Tech. I'm the biggest sort of plug for Staten Island Tech that we had many students from Brooklyn. In fact, I moved, my family moved to Staten Island in the beginning of my freshman year. Um, so I commuted for a bit. Did I feel confident on test day? So confidence is something that you guys have to build. I still get nervous before big tests that I take. That's completely normal. And some level of nervousness actually helps us do better on the test. It's healthy. Um, you just have to manage it, right? There's that sweet spot in the middle. Too much nervousness is bad. And being not nervous at all is bad because then you're careless and you don't care. You want that sweet spot of you're nervous, but you know that you prepared and you know that you're well prepared because you studied and because you have all the support at Queller Prep and you have the support of your family and everybody else. And th that sweet spot in the middle is going to get you to your success. Questions and topics in the math section. We'll do that next Thursday. Um, would I, you, I don't, I don't, I think you can bring snacks, but you can't eat them during the test. You can probably eat them before or after, but all of this information will be in your, like, um, take on your ticket when you guys, uh, register, have to print that out or whatever it is that they make you do these days. Um, all that information should be there and on the website as well. And I'm sure Mrs. Queller will send out an email before the test. Okay, any, I just talked a lot and really, really fast um, because I was trying to like speed through all of your questions as fast as I could until seven o'clock. And I'm happy to say that we're finishing on time. Again, just a reminder that we'll have this again, Sunday, 10 to 12, um, where I will continue, um, we'll review this poem, then we'll do grammar. Um, I don't believe that you get a break between sections. You get three hours for the full thing and you can choose when to switch, switch sections yourself and where you begin your, like which section you begin with yourself. And tips to enhance your score in a short time is to focus on these webinars and extract as many strategies as you can and then apply them. Do as much practice as you can before the test. All right, guys, so we're nearing seven o'clock. Um, thank you so much to everybody. I'm sure that Mrs. Francis is going to send out the notes. Um, I will put my email, my color prep email in the chat in case you guys need anything from me. Um, and then I can also send a PDF of the notes if you send me an email and you want it today, but I'm sure she'll send it out. Um, any questions, concerns, I will stay for a few minutes. I think Mrs. Queller already logged out because she has another webinar right after, um, but I'm happy to stay for like an extra five, 10 minutes, answer any last minute questions. Again, I put my email in there so um, you guys can contact me. If you send me an email right now, I could reply back with a PDF, um, but I'm sure she'll send it out in the recording as well. Um, what will test day look like? Okay, so again, I might not be the best person to ask because I took this test a long time ago, but from what I remember, um, you walk into the school that you're taking it in, there's like a big line, you go in with like your ID and I had like a paper I had to print out. I'm not sure if now it's virtual and you just like confirm that you're there for the test and then they sit you in the room um, and then you just take your test. That's basically what it looks like. Um, no, I don't think you can um, eat or drink during the test, but you can pack snacks in your bag and then eat it after. Um, well, yeah, we're absolutely gonna do more practice on math. The math session with me is next Thursday at the same time, five to seven. Um, yes. And of course, you're welcome so much. If there's any way that I can be more helpful, you guys wanna give feedback, I, it's absolutely appropriate. You can give me feedback and tell me what to do to better prepare you guys. This is really a resource for you. Um, I want you guys to, to do well and to for this to be as useful as, as possible. And I know there's like a lot of anxiety that comes with the test. Like I promise you I'm used to it as well because I've taken a lot of tests in my life. So I absolutely don't mind any of the questions, whether they're about content or or experience of the test or school or anything like that. See you on Sunday. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. <laughs> With starting on the section you're worse at, be a good idea. Um, I think it's a preference. I think that you shouldn't change the way that you've been practicing if it's been working for you. Personally, I'd probably start with my good section first because I want to make sure that I get like all the points that I'm good at and that I'm 100% like good at. And also because my good section is faster. So then I would leave more time for the bad section. 
Um, but again, it's a preference um, and you want it to be consistent. So whatever it is that you've been doing every time you do a practice test, you want that consistency on, on test day. So if you were going to switch something now, you definitely want to take a few practice tests with that switch. So just confirm that it's going to work for you. You don't want to just like try anything new on the day of your test. That's never a good idea. Okay, so I'm just going to keep this running um, and just create like the note set for today and email this to myself, but you guys can go ahead and ask any questions that you want in the chat. I'm still monitoring it. And if there's no more questions, then I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and end this webinar. Um, I would, I usually fill out the answer sheet as I'm going, right? Because if you see that you're running out of time, then you're scrambling in to fill in your answers. Like that's the thing that's gonna, that they really, does that make sense? Um, so you don't want to be in a position where like the test is ending, you have two minutes left and half your sheet is bubbled because when pencils are down, pencils are down. Even if you have all the right answers on, in your booklet, nobody will count it for you if it's not, um, if it's not on your sheet. All right, everybody, any other questions before I end this? Okay, um, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna end for today. Thank you guys so much for joining. Again, I'll see you all on Sunday. If you have any questions or concerns or just like something that you didn't want to put in the chat for whatever reason, you're free to email me and I uh, will try to be as responsive as possible. And if I don't respond, just spam me, like email me again, because like I could miss an email, right? I'm human. Um, and I also get like a lot of emails with school and everything else. Um, so it's not personal. Just email me again and I'll get back to you. And then I'll see you guys all on Sunday. Again, reminder, we're going to finish this poem because we didn't get to do the questions. And then we'll do grammar for the rest of Sunday. And that session's from 10 a.m. to noon. So I'll see you all then. Have a good night. I'm going to end the meeting now. Bye.